I'm Nikki Terrio and welcome to Gallery 78 where we'll take you on a tour of our current exhibitions while we're closed to the public. These works are all on our website at gallery78.com. This exhibition, Natural Perspectives, features 13 artists' unique perspectives of the world around them, all of which are on our website, and I'll be reading words of reflection from each artist as we tour their works. Visual arts writer, artist, and educator Danielle Hogan captures the streets and breathtaking mountains in ink and watercolor from a trip she made last fall to the Banff Center for a conference called Arts, Culture, and Digital Transformation. These were painted during her breaks, and she explains that she prefers painting while traveling, whether for business or pleasure, because she is better able to capture the feeling and essence of the places she goes than while taking pictures. We've shown previous travel series of hers before, from her times in Prince Edward Island to Australia, Barcelona, and beyond. Senior New Brunswick painter of landscapes, buildings, and sites, Peter Salmon describes this piece in particular, Snow on the Whirligig. The first real snowfall came in mid-December of 2018, very gently, and by the afternoon, the sky had turned blue. The sun shone, and it was very still. The entrance to my studio in West Quaco, including the Whirligig, was covered in delicate snow as I took pictures. A slight whiff of a breeze, and the snow was gone, but I had the photo. Incidentally, this was my last painting and is the longest time I have stopped painting since 1985. Very sadly, Peter passed away on March 18th, 2020, and this piece is indeed the last painting he created. Here is one of Matthew Collins' pieces. Can you guess where this is in Nova Scotia? I'll tell you later in the video. St. John New Brunswick native and nationally renowned figurative and landscape painter Robert Francis Michael McInnes speaks to this series, The View from Behind the Mountain. The view we had from our seniors' residence in Montreal overlooked Mount Royal from the north and the city of Montreal. It was a grand panoramic view. Painting it seasonally would be the kind of effortless challenge I required at this late stage of my career. Having moved to Montreal in early 2019, after years on the flat prairie, I had no idea what I would be painting, nor how I would paint it. With this grand view outside our 10th floor window, the question was answered for me. I would not have to drive to find scenery, nor did that kind of landscape appeal to me. I was more interested in strengthening the design elements of the view and simplifying it. Subject matter was less important. This view presented what I required for my new interests. With this scene, I saw that what Monet must have felt in his cathedral fronts, his haystacks, and his London fog, a series of the same scene painted over and over again in different cloud conditions, colors, times of day, time of year, weather conditions, seasonally, day and night, and everything in between. While Monet had his parliament buildings and haystacks, Cézanne had his Mont Saint-Victoire. Japanese artist Hiroshigi had his 100 views of Mount Fuji. I had Mount Royal. I sat in my comfortable office chair in front of the large window and drew and painted. Ultimately, I had some 40 oil sketches and an equal number of ink drawings and pencil sketches. A senior's residence is not the most conducive situation in which to do large canvases, so I limited myself to small panels none bigger than 12 by 12 inches, and most 9 by 12 and smaller. I started in May 2019 when my wife Françoise and I first moved in. Pale, silvery green leaves were just budding. After that, it was a long green summer. Autumn came and I was anxious for yellow, but it was a Montreal winter I wanted most. The white snows that simplifies all. Flat, simple, the bare essence of the scene. My view made the city flat, almost prairie-like. With several paintings of winter under my belt, I had achieved what I had set out to do. I had painted what I had felt less than what I saw, a key component to all my art. Then I declared the series complete, 
And so it was. On New Year's Day 2020, I painted the last of the Views series. Recent graduate in ceramics at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design, Tomo Ingalls reflects. When we are born, we start off as a complete egg, a sphere. But somehow as we grow, we feel like we are missing something or someone. What I created are the cutout sections of the sphere shape. The flat surfaces are inside of a person, showing his or her experiences of life. Our life is an accumulation of experiences. I would like to think all our experiences will eventually nurture us to grow back into a full sphere. Most of us don't, but that is okay. And maybe that is why many of us search for someone that completes us. Mid-career Nova Scotia artist with an impressive resume, Matthew Collins, who is known for his use of vivid colors and texture aplenty in his paintings of coastal scenes, writes, I usually have a rough idea of where I'm going when I start a painting. However, I often take a few side roads along the way. It tends to be an organic process. I do not do any preliminary sketches or studies, but work straight on the canvas with paint. Sometimes my paintings take representational form and others lean more toward the abstract. Either way, I attempt to make it interesting for myself and the viewer. I'm always trying new techniques and mixing it up in one work to another. What is consistent, I believe, is color and paint application. As in the other painting, I took the liberty to exaggerate the pink in the road. In this Rose Bay painting, it appears I also have taken some artistic liberation in terms of color. However, they are not as exaggerated as one may think. The colors created along the shores on an early summer evening can form surreal scenes. I am guided by a forever unfolding art history and motivated by nature itself. Senior New Brunswick artist and elected member of the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts, known and revered countrywide for his egg tempera and watercolor works, David McKay has exhibited and has work in important public collections internationally. He has this to say. I think my artwork is generally considered as being realistic or representational in genre. However, I'm not so interested in the factual, realistic representation of objects as one might think. I try to represent their character and soul, or their emotional impact on me. I don't like to copy things and therefore rarely work from photographs or on location. My images seem to be created from a combination of memory and imagination. It is a free and very creative way to work. From my studio, I can imagine and remember the sound of field rocks clinging together when I walked on them as a child and I can hear that dead sound of a heavy iron ring clanging against a concrete pier on a wharf along the river, the way they did when boats were secured to them. I don't like getting wet, but the knees of my pants and my feet got wet and muddy while picking fiddleheads on the islands of the Nashwalk River. My old chestnut canoe pulled up on shore and replaces the leafy skiff from my childhood. The canoe shape changes with every inch along its body and it is a wonderful thing to capture and paint. I love how white pine boughs get stretch out horizontally, whooshing as they sway in the slight breeze. The sound and smell, the movement is hypnotic. Nova Scotia based Nensky painter, who is originally from Los Angeles, Peter DeJesu has exhibited in public venues in California, Japan, and India, and his work is in permanent collections in North America. He writes that, the landscape, as it is, never lies. Its balance of form, light, color, and space is always perfect. We use it as a place of reference to return to again and again when the painting tends towards the abstract. In my case, being from the western part of the continent, space is the main consideration. I usually end up taking a lot of things out or editing the painting before it looks right to me.
Dawn McNutt's work has been exhibited in shows throughout the world, from the Far East, Europe, to the United States and Canada. Dawn's sculptures have been collected by important public collections internationally. She is an elected member of the Royal Canadian Academy of the Arts and has been honored with a Doctorate of Laws by Mount Allison University and Doctorate of Humane Letters by Mount St. Vincent University. In these pieces of our exhibition, she has used painted willow. Inspiration in her words. My work focuses on the human form and what I perceive as the beauty of human frailty. Inspired by human forms of ancient times and present day, and by architecture past and present, I am drawn to the universality of human emotion, leading to simplification and abstraction of form. These two pieces are called Warm Rain and Summer. Senior New Brunswick Francophone artist Femme Martin exhibits nationally and paints a wide variety of subjects from people to landscapes, animals, places he's visited, all with classic style of old and bright colors and shapes. People gravitate toward his work as they are stimulating yet comforting, compelling us to look at the land and its creaturely inhabitants. In his words, these works evoke the different states in which each was created, stemming from a recollection, an anecdote, a whimsical delirium, or all of these combined. The human being is represented alone in relationship with an object, sewing, transforming, or creating it in a determined geographical location. The content emphasizes the internal dynamics within the individual with a view to introspection. Painter, writer, illustrator, and adventurer in the great outdoors of New Brunswick and beyond, Jean Roy has worked in collections internationally and has undertaken important commissions by the Nature Trust of New Brunswick and the Nature Conservancy of Canada. He writes, there is no river that feels as much as home as the Nipissigwit River. I've paddled that waterway many times. My favorite section is the upper section where the river flows out of the Bathurst Lakes in the Mount Carlton Provincial Park. That remote section is wilder than the rest of the river and is not easily accessible by other means than a canoe. On this painting, Mount Charmise keeps an eye on this particular bend of the river as I set up my campsite nearby for the evening. As much as I enjoy Canadian's small rivers, when I'm traveling to Paris, I'm inevitably compelled by the Seine. This urban river slowly flows through the city and feels as ancient as any rivers from back home. The stonework of bridges and old buildings reminds me of cliffs and hills that curb most Canadian rivers while keeping an eye on the waterway. And as an interesting fact, Réjean has been invited by the New Brunswick publishing company Bouton d'Or to participate at Parisian book fairs on several occasions. Painter of classical East Coast subjects and scenes, senior Nova Scotia artist Stephen Rood exhibits and has work in prestigious public collections across Canada. He is a philosophical creator with references to art, history, and contemporary narratives, and writes about his two pieces. Lovers of London. Love, one word de that describes so many complex emotions and states. Physical love, spiritual love, brotherly and sisterly love, parental love, love of spouse, family, community, country, place, love of a town and city, love of nature, land and sea. The list goes on and on. However, the overview of our lives as individuals usually is composed around the nature of love. Love suspends time, and thus how we arrange our insight into love is often revelatory. When I gestured in this painting, the couple kissing were more visible. As the painting progressed, they became more enmeshed and tangled within the landscape, the warmth of the landscape imbuing the couple's love for each other. Above the coal mine. For close to a decade, coal was really king of the region. By 1904, the year Inverness was incorporated as a town, 
The major mine was down 2,500 feet, much of it under the present gulf links and extending farther beneath the sea. There were 482 coal miners employed and the town had grown in population to 3,000. The miners received $1.25 a day and worked six days per week to a total of 70 hours. It is difficult as we prepare to play golf to contemplate daily wages of 125 as paid in 1904. It is difficult also to imagine our relatives and ancestors at work beneath the fairways and greens of today's links. International adventure and motorsport photographer who has traveled and photographed in over 90 countries, Jason Nugent, based in Fredericton, New Brunswick, says, The two pieces today are a result of an expedition in the Himalaya of Nepal. One of the most difficult aspects of any expedition is the planning of the thing, the logistics involved, and this project was especially difficult. There was significant waiting and delay, which in retrospect made the entire experience more rewarding. I've explored Buddhism my entire life. I'm not especially good at it. I am goal-oriented and vastly prefer seeing progression toward accomplishment versus leaving things to chance. For this endeavor, I was forced to develop patience to become better at leaving aspects of my life to unseen forces. For this, I am grateful. There is a region of Nepal in the Himalaya called the Annapurna Sanctuary, and so there is obvious homage to that in these two pieces. When I found myself there, ringed by mountains exceeding 8,000 meters, the literal roof of the world, I discovered a more personal meaning of the word. Being so far from home, disconnected, I discovered my own personal sanctuary and had time to reflect on my own life and what I wanted from it. There is an immediacy to Nepal. It is very difficult to not be present when surrounded by mountains, landscapes that demand your attention. I left Nepal feeling calm and more at peace with the world and my place in it. It turns out that not wanting to get anything out of life to instead accept what happens as a matter of course is a much better way forward. I'm still not a very good Buddhist, but at least now I have the memories from this expedition to guide me. The images presented here reflect my time there and try to encompass not just the landscape, but also the people and animals who call the Annapurna region of Nepal home. Gyaru After Snow was created in the morning after a heavy snow had fallen on the village. I was temporarily marooned in. I was able to get out quite early and capture this image, showing the sleepy village before the snow melted later in the day. Ancient Stupa and Annapurna is a piece that, for me, summarizes my experience in the Himalayas. We see an ancient Buddhist temple with the huge Annapurna massif in the background, and the juxtaposition really illustrates the harmonious balance at play in the country. If you haven't already guessed, this piece by Matthew Collins is of Queen Street in Chester, Nova Scotia. Here are some more photographs of the Annapurna and Gangapurna Mountains in Nepal. We'll take our little tour up the stairs to the rest of the exhibition. Here's another painting by Peter Salmon of a house in Rue, New Brunswick. Renowned photographer of panoramic landscapes, figurative works, and large still lifes, senior New Brunswick artist James Wilson says, Red Road. This photograph is a commercial blueberry field, and in the autumn season, the field turns scared red. It is a manufactured landscape that has aged nicely over the years. Some berry plants have migrated to the center of the road, creating separate little gardens in themselves. The wandering service road becomes the center of interest for this composition, carrying the eye from the foreground through this magical space and exiting at the top. This magnificence, this image, sorry, is strikingly unusual, highly detailed with textures and vibrant red colors with touches of green and orange, giving the viewer the impression 
you just might be on another planet. A major exhibition of his portraits called Social Studies will open at Beaver Book Art Gallery in June this year, accompanied by a coffee table book published by Goose Lane Editions. We hope you enjoyed our tour. Thanks for watching.